Hello, I'm Professor Andy Parker. I'm a professor of high energy physics and the head of the physics department at the University of Cambridge, which is hosted at the famous Cavendish Laboratories. I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, Cambridge conversation, uh, which is the 17th in what has proved to be a very popular series, uh, bringing you ideas and research from Cambridge University. Um, after our conversation, there will be around 20 minutes where our speakers will respond to audience questions. Um, which you can submit at any point by clicking on the Q&A uh, and then typing your question. The Q&A box is at the bottom of the page. So last year was a very exciting year with many moments that changed and defined the way in which we understand the origins of life and its distribution in the universe. Um, the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover is, as we speak, busy collecting samples on Mars um, and looking for things which offer the best chances of finding traces of early life. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope was a big splash in the media, and it's begun its mission to map the atmospheres of exoplanets, that is planets around other stars, which are potentially inhabitable. And at the same time, there's been a wave of discoveries around the pathways which would have generated building blocks for life on Earth itself, starting from simple molecules in ancient environments. And this year offers even more breakthroughs on how we understand our place in the universe. Um, in June, uh, the new Leverhulme Centre for Life in the Universe opens in Cambridge. Uh, this is a 10-year interdisciplinary research programme which will harness simultaneous breakthroughs in astrophysics, planetology, organic chemistry and biology. And its aim is to tackle the greatest challenges of our time, which is to understand how life emerged on Earth, whether the universe is full of life, and to ask indeed what the nature of life is. Now, for those who are not directly involved in this sort of exciting research progress, it's natural to wonder who are these people? Who are these researchers? Um, how do they work across their different disciplines to understand such a fundamental question? What are their aims? What tools do they now have to identify life, which we didn't have a few years ago? And in fact, you may wonder, what do we mean by life in the universe at all? So joining me today to discuss some of these fascinating and intriguing questions, we have a, a very stellar panel. Um, the first is Professor Nicholas Tosca. He is a professor of mineralogy and petrology, and he's the only UK scientist who has been selected by NASA to be part of the core science team for the Mars Perseverance 2020 mission. Welcome, Nicholas. Second, we have Dr. Emily Mitchell, who is a National Environment Research Fellow and a quantitative ecologist working on understanding how ecology impacts evolution through deep time. Welcome, Emily. And finally, Professor Niku Madhusudan, a professor of astrophysics and extraplanetary science at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Welcome, Madhu. So we're going to begin with some questions to the panel. Um, and let me start you off with this one. Uh, so the Cambridge Initiative for Planetary Science and Life in the Universe, the IPLU, opened last year, and it brings together researchers from the Cavendish Laboratory, which is our Department of Physics, the Institute of Astronomy, Department of Applied Mass and Theoretical Physics, the Department of Chemistry, the Department of Earth Sciences, and other Cambridge departments, including Arts and Humanities, um, to enable cross-disciplinary research on planetology, the origin and nature of life of the universe. Now, each of you are here today are leading researchers in this initiative. And thanks to a 10 million pound 10 year grant from the Leverhulme Trust in June, uh, the new Leverhulme Center for Life in the Universe will take over the activities of the IPLU to continue efforts in understanding how life emerged on Earth, where the universe is full of life and ask what the nature of life is. So could you please each start by spending a minute telling you what your role is within this initiative? What are the broader aims of the field that you work in? And if I may, I'll start with you, Nick. Thank you, Andy. Um, so as an associate director of the Leverhulme Center, uh, I'll just say a few words about uh, how the activities of the center relate to the IPLU. The, the scientific focus of the center be very much the same as the IPLU. The difference is, is that it will involve a broader group of Cambridge academics. Um, and this will include scholars from arts and humanities, in particular, uh, the Faculty of Divinity uh, and Department of History and Philosophy of Science. Um, and, and those scholars will contribute perspectives on what life is, uh, and they can help uh, challenge the concepts and the language that's typically employed in work of this sort, yet is heavily biased towards our own example of life on Earth. 
And so the, the other important thing to note about the center is that it includes, um, as members, a select number of, of scholars from other institutions internationally, including uh, institutions like Harvard, uh, Princeton, ETH, Zurich, uh, and the University of Colorado, um, with whom uh, we'll all work uh, quite closely. It's important to emphasize that the center won't be an insular endeavor. It will very much be an international one, um, though it will be led by Cambridge academics. And so for my own part, um, as an earth scientist, I, I feel that earth scientists can contribute to the aims of the center in at least three ways. Um, one is contributing to our understanding of origins of life um, and um, what is uh, called prebiotic chemistry. Um, and really what earth scientists can contribute um, is uh, understanding uh, the following questions. So for example, um, what environments uh, might have characterized the early earth and in what ways did those environments facilitate or even frustrate chemical pathways to life? So it's really the combination of the earth sciences disciplines uh, with prebiotic chemistry that can really lead to significant advances in that particular field. The second relates to astrophysics and exoplanets. Um, so as earth scientists, we can ask questions um, related to the observations uh, that are coming from the exoplanetary science and what they mean for our understanding of how planets uh, form and evolve. We have no real standard for, for how planets form and evolve because they're subject to, uh, to random processes throughout their formation and evolution. But the flood of data coming from exoplanetary science will, uh, will prompt us to, to ask how small changes in boundary conditions, for example, things like uh, size, temperature, proximity to the host star uh, might constrain planetary evolution and, and how that might influence the range of planetary environments and systems that might be possible uh, that could potentially host life. Thank you, Nick. Let me turn to Emily, please, uh, your role in all of this. So um, I work in the Department of Zoology. And so my role is very much trying to understand what the nature is or, or could be of life on other planets. So life has changed very dramatically in the history of life on Earth. We've gone from purely microbial life for three billion years to this diverse world that we live in now, full of animals and plants. And so by considering how evolution progresses through time and how that might apply to different planets, we can start to understand the nature of, of life on other planets. Thank you. And uh, Madhu, how about you? So uh, I lead a research group on exoplanet uh, atmospheres and interiors at the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge. And uh, within this center, uh, I lead um, both within the IPLU and what is going to be the Leverhulme Center, I would lead uh, the research efforts on observing the atmospheric um, uh, properties, atmospheric spectra of these exoplanets across a wide range of, um, of conditions and interpreting those observations to detect signs of chemical compositions uh, in their atmospheres and other uh, atmospheric properties and surface properties. So our research is usually um, uh, directed towards using the latest state-of-the-art facilities like the James Webb Space Telescope and large ground-based facilities uh, to detect exoplanet uh, spectra, but also to develop remote, new remote sensing techniques and theoretical methods to interpret those observations, as well as do some more ab initio theoretical work to understand what sort of planets uh, would be habitable uh, around different stars and where should we look, basically, uh, in search of life elsewhere. Okay, so sounds like a pretty formidable team. Um, now, each of your fields brings something towards this uh, towards this broader question about life in the universe. It brings something transformative, really, in, in terms of what we can hope to understand. Um, what's happened within your individual dif disciplines recently to make this the time for this research to happen um, and to pursue this research together? Um, and let me turn back to Nick. I think uh, in the discipline of Earth and planetary sciences, um, that's really come out of the last decade of Mars exploration. Uh, and the big revolution there has been in our understanding of planetary environments and their capacity to, uh, to support an origin or emergence of, of life. The, the problem is, it's that on Earth, we have no record of the earliest environments because plate tectonics has obliterated uh, the geological, uh, geological record from that time period. Uh, but the absence of plate tectonics on Mars has uh, preserved an extensive record of sedimentary rocks and, and those rock level, uh, the chemical and surface environments. It's really a, a unique geologic record that's uh, available nowhere else in the solar system. 
And so we can really ask exciting questions through Mars exploration that teach us about uh, the evolution of, of life on our own planet and the role of the environment. So did liquid water persist long enough for life to emerge on Mars? Did the redox state of the surface and atmosphere facilitate prebiotic synthesis and so on? Um, and, and if not, if life never got started on Mars, how did those environments uh, uh, you know, and their evolution uh, differ from, from that of the Earth? So that's really been the, the major revolution from, from my point of view. Okay, thank you. Um, Emily. Well, I, th I think what's really, really exciting for evolutionary biologists and uh, biologists in general at the moment is that uh, it's very much a starting to get uh, the possibility of actually detecting life on other planets over the next 10 years or so. So it's not so much about what um, evolutionary biology has been doing recently, it's about very much placing ourselves and understanding what these uh, different sorts of signs of life may look like and how we'd interpret them and how we'd use them to try and understand the nature of, of, of the life on other planets. So for us, it's positioning ourselves, working with our, our, our wonderful colleagues to, to understand what, what this life uh, actually means. Yes, I think we may come back a bit later to what, what do we mean by life indeed. Um, so Madhu. Yeah, so we are really going through a revolutionary time in modern astronomy and astrophysics, and uh, much of that is driven on the exoplanet science front. Specific to this area, there are two major revolutions that are happening as we speak. We, we know that thousands of exoplanets have been discovered around other stars over the last two decades. Uh, to last count, I think it's about uh, 5,000 planets that we already know. Um, but what's happening recently is that we have been discovering planets in the habitable zones around their host stars, the Goldilocks zones where uh, water uh, is possible on their surfaces uh, around nearby stars. And, and that, that is remarkable uh, because for, for once, for now, uh, we are beginning to look at targets that around nearby stars whose atmospheres we can observe, where we can get atmospheric spectroscopy and understand their chemical compositions. And that's huge. We wouldn't have been able to do this just 10 years ago, for example. And then the second major development that's happening is the James Webb uh, Space Telescope that's re recently been launched, and it's currently undergoing uh, commissioning. So in the next uh, couple of months, we'll be ready to make uh, these observations of uh, atmospheric spectra of exoplanets. And this is literally the largest space telescope ever sent. Uh, um, and it's going to revolutionize all of astronomy, uh, but more specifically on the exoplanet science, uh, we might, it, it allows us for the first time to be able to look at these habitable zone planets and potentially uh, discover the first possible biosignatures uh, or, or the, in, within this decade. Uh, I say with, that with uh, uh, a certain caution, but also with a lot of optimism because we know, and we work on, in my group, work on uh, planets like those. We know some of those targets are accessible with James Webb Space Telescope. And at the same time, um, there are also large ground-based facilities coming up. The European Extremely Large Telescope, a 40 meter aperture telescope is coming uh, within this decade as well. So all these observational developments means that we are literally at that cusp in the history of our species, if I, if I may use uh, the context, uh, to maybe for the first time detect uh, life elsewhere. And that is really exciting and momentous occasion that we are living through. Thank you, Mario. I mean, it's amazing that we could actually be declaring uh, biosignatures within a decade. So this is really imminent. Can I just clarify, you, you, you said that there were 5,000 exoplanets discovered, but I think if you take what you've seen and you extrapolate to the galaxy, what you're saying is that there are tens of billions of oh, yeah, planets. Yeah, yeah. So these are, we call it the solar neighborhood. We are still talking about hundreds of light years as they is our farthest observational reach right now. Uh, maybe even like a thousand light years. But if you talk about frequency of planets, the current frequency uh, you know, that we can estimate is close to one. Like we think almost every star out there ought to have a planet of some kind around it. And miraculously, the small planets, the Earth and super Earth sized planets are the most common planets that we are discovering. So, so it's a really uh, amazing uh, discoveries that we are making um, with, with our facilities already. Okay, thank you. So, so that means that if there are tens of billions of planets that the, the odds on finding uh, of life being out there somewhere 
must be reasonable, even if our chance of finding it may not be so great. So, so let's come to, to this question, which many people I'm sure will want to hear your opinions on. Um, we're talking about life, but what defines life in the universe? Uh, is this something you all agree on or in your different fields are there different definitions of life? And if so, how, how are you going to reconcile uh, those different positions if, uh, if you're trying to agree on what you're looking for? And can you also comment on uh, whether you have the correct tools to identify life um, if you see biosignatures in planetary atmospheres? So let me go to Emily for that. So the, the question, what is life, sounds quite obvious because we've all got an intuition of what's alive. We know that trees are alive, we know that cats are alive, we know that we're alive. But actually, it can end up not being quite so, so straightforward. And so one of a, a common example is thinking about viruses. So we all know that viruses evolve. Um, and so in that aspect, they're alive, they can adapt to new circumstances. However, because they can't exist or replicate without a host, they're not really alive. And actually lots of, or, or some, a lot of people don't actually think they are alive. And, and different mi microbiologists will say different things about viruses being alive or not. Um, and so NASA uh, actually got a, a group of scientists together to try and define life. And what they came up with was that life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. And so every single one of those words is incredibly important. And so um, to start off with, you know, what do we mean by chemical system? So this is the ability to metabolize, that's for chemicals to transform into each other, mediated by things like enzymes, that is other molecules. And that importantly, these, these enzymes actually can inherit their molecular structure. So the, these very important structures that can change molecules from one to another um, are, are passed down uh, through the generations of different molecules. So the second aspect of that is the self-sustaining. So this is very much living things being able to regulate their own world. So we can keep our bodies in a nice state of equilibrium. So we stay happy and we stay alive. And then the final aspect of that is Darwinian evolution. And so this is the idea that um, biological species arise and develop through natural selection. So that's there are small uh, inherited, critically inherited uh, variations um, in organisms that can increase in, uh, the, the creature's ability to survive. And they can do this by getting better at reproducing, by outcompeting other organisms uh, for shared resources, for example, or but because they can survive uh, pathogens or predators better. And so this is this is a system that uh, that NASA and <laughs> NASA is using. Um, I look forward to <laughs> hearing uh, how much uh, Nick and Maddo agree with that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, understanding the tools that we need to identify life on other planet, I mean that's very much where the Earth scientists and the uh, the physicists come in. I would say. Okay. Well, on that note, then I'll I'll turn to Maddo, who can tell us how how he's ever going to detect a biosignature when all he can see is a flicker of light from a tiny planet next to a star multiple light years away. Yeah, um, so, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so it is, uh, it, it's, it's challenging. So there are very many aspects of that question which have a lot of uncertainties associated with them. But from a practical perspective, from an astronomer's perspective, specifically I'll talk about our approach is we are going to look for molecular signatures of biology of life in the atmospheres of these planets. And we can only start with a template that we have close to, uh, close to home on earth. We have a biosignatures like uh, oxygen and from it ozone and nitrous oxide and methane and so on. But we can't just say, let's look at these molecules and establish if there is life elsewhere or not. So there are lots of efforts under, uh, you know, going on in the field where people have tried to quantify the uh, false positives, how unique these molecules are um, uh, in terms of defining, uh, tying them to life, uh, even here on earth or in other uh, planetary conditions. So we do have a list of molecules, uh, starting with these basic molecules, but also several other molecules which are secondary biomarkers, not the dominant ones like dimethyl sulfide or methyl chloride and so on which you can actually tie uh, specifically to life on earth and maybe those are better markers of life. So, so in the field, we have come up with a set of these molecules, both the primary dominant biomarkers and uh, less abundant biomarkers, which we would go and search for in atmospheres of other planets. And then we work backwards. If we detect them in the first place, 
because you have to understand these are, as you said, these are very small faint signals. Even detecting any of these molecules would be a major technological achievement in the first place. So, so we would go from a very practical approach of identifying planets that are in the habitable zones and are potentially habitable, and then look at their atmospheres, detect these potential biomarkers, and then do the interpretation of it on whether they specifically tell us about life. And for that, we need to have multiple biomarkers and to break the degeneracies uh, between these various possibilities. Okay, thank you. So, so let me turn to you, Nick, and perhaps you, you're looking much closer to home. You've got a, a planet with a rover on it. You don't have to um, peer across the universe. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the search for life on Mars and, um, and whether you're looking for life now or life then, as it were, was there life on Mars? Yes, that's right. I, I guess I'll start off by saying that uh, I very much like NASA's uh, definition of life. It's, it's broad enough to encompass um, a whole range of different possibilities, um, but it identifies a lot of specific features that we as scientists think are essential. And I guess regarding the role of the chemical system in that definition, for, for Mars, you know, when we're looking closer to home, our planetary neighbor, um, we think that um, elements like water and carbon uh, and, and the other elements that uh, are uh, composed uh, life on Earth today are pretty much the only game in town. And that's because the planet is made of the same basic building blocks as the Earth and it evolved down a very similar evolutionary trajectory. And in fact, we know from exploring the geology that the early environments on Mars are actually quite similar to what we think uh, early environments on Earth were life like. And so when we talk about life on Mars, we're really talking about ancient life uh, uh, on that planet, uh, potentially four or three billion years ago. Now, in looking for life, um, many of the audience might be aware that it's one of the goals of the Mars 2020 mission to select uh, samples to eventually be returned to Earth within about 10 years or so. And that's because the rover is not equipped with the instruments necessary to come up with an unambiguous uh, answer as to whether or not um, those uh, ancient sedimentary rocks might have hosted life, which is why we need to study those samples back in the laboratory. Um, and I'll say that even with Mars sample return, conclusive answers to the question of whether or not uh, Mars ever hosted life will, will be hard won. Uh, the answers won't come easy. And if we want to understand our planetary neighbor and whether or not it ever supported life, it's, it's worth doing and it's worth doing it right. Thank you. I, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing the technolo technology that has been deployed both on the Mars rovers and on these telescopes to, uh, to make these measurements and, and these discoveries. Uh, I don't think the public quite appreciates how hard it is to drive a buggy on Mars. Um, so, okay. Uh, so you all have amazing skills. So how we are interdisciplinary collaboration make your collected knowledge greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and maybe I'll start again with you, Nick, if I may. Yeah, so the questions we've been talking about uh, in this webinar are very broad, but very significant. They've, uh, they've interested humanity for as long as, uh, as uh, recorded history uh, has informed us. The questions we're asking really transcend uh, traditional discipline boundaries. And so in order to make progress on these questions, um, we need to work together. And if we wanna address these questions seriously, we need to work together in a way that we never have been, uh, we never have been able to before. Um, so, uh, you know, that's saying that one scientific discipline cannot really address these questions sufficiently on their own. Uh, for example, you know, one can understand prebiotic chemistry in the laboratory, but whether or not prebiotic chemical pathways, you know, might work in the environment, you know, requires a, a knowledge of earth sciences and environmental sciences and, and earth history. That uh, is in turn linked to planetary evolution, which is in turn linked to, you know, a planet's dynamical and, and, uh, and stellar environment. So the principal challenge is, is that we, we need to develop a new mode of scholarship and new modes of, of learning from each other and new modes of communication. So learning each other's language and, and how to really uh, make significant ground in, in um, addressing some of these questions. Okay, thank you. Emily, how about you? How do you see it? Well, I think uh, the, the biological aspects are obviously uh, very, very crucial, but it's very much um, using what we know about the history of life on Earth to try and work out what potential biosignatures could mean. So 
we, we know that oxygen levels have changed very dramatically over the last uh, four billion years. And so by, by trying to look at what sort of life corresponds to, for example, different levels of oxygen, we can actually then start to, to try and work out what's the kind of underlying levels of complexity of the life that, that's, that we're detecting is. We also have the very intriguing possibility if we start getting very, very lucky further down the line and detecting lots of different biosignatures to start trying to almost reverse engineer what's going on evolutionary on other planets. So we've only got n equals one here on Earth. But if we have, you know, thousands of different biosignatures, we can start to try and work out by taking into account things like the amount, the, the, the age of the planets, how does that compare to Earth and how will that then feed into our ideas of evolution? So are we lucky to be here as humans and animals on Earth? You know, is it actually quite hard um, for evolutionary processes and other planets to get to this sort of level of complexity? Or um, are actually other planets populated by much more complex organisms? And we actually took a very long time to get here and we're unlucky. So there's this wonderful kind of mix of using the biological aspects to understand what we're seeing, but then potentially further down the road to bring that back into actually understanding evolution itself. Okay, and, and Maddie, finally on this. Yeah, so, so we, uh, in looking for life elsewhere uh, in exoplanets, we are asking what is possibly the grandest question a civilization has ever asked, our species has ever asked, but we start with a significant setback that we are starting with one example right here on Earth. So we have no template other than this to look for. Um, so the interdisciplinarity uh, 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 is essential in that sense, in, in that once we detect any signs of a possible biosignature, how we interpret that very much depends on connecting the various dots, the geological context, the stellar environment, the possible biology, all these different areas. So exoplanet science is inherently an interdisciplinary um, endeavor. And uh, that's why our efforts fit right in uh, to what we are trying to do here. Okay, thank you. And so one final question before we turn to the audience questions. Um, when we went to the launch of the IL, uh, IPLU, um, our very own Nobel Prize winner, um, Professor Didier Kello, who is the leader of the Leverhulme Center, um, uh, said this. He said that in terms of the origin of life and the question of life in the universe, essentially we know nothing. We are still at the beginning. Now, that can be read as a rather negative statement or as a rather positive one that we're opening a whole field. But would you agree with him? And if so, why or, or, or why not? And, and what, does your, uh, what do you think the future of, of this research area looks like? Um, so Nick, please. I'll uh, try to keep my answer brief. Um, I agree with Didier, but with a caveat. Um, it is true that understanding life in the universe is a wide open field and that a lot of discoveries will, uh, will await. I will say, though, that um, this moment and, uh, and, and the initiation of this interdisciplinary research center have come after about you know, a, a decade or two of significant uh, advances in each of our own disciplines uh, that have really paved the way to, to tackle these questions in a very serious way. Um, so that's the only sort of caveat that I'd, um, I'd add to that statement. I mean, in 10 years time, I hope that Cambridge will be leading the conversation on the capacity of planets to support life. I mean, at a, at a minimum, in uh, that time, we may have viable chemical pathways to life that are set in an environmental and planetary context. And we could use that to potentially say something uh, about the probability that life might, might exist uh, elsewhere. However, um, and the more optimistic end, because so many of us are involved in discovery-led missions, um, the sky's the limit. And so we'll, we'll just have to, to, to wait to, uh, to see what, what discoveries uh, await us in the next few years. Just briefly, um, Emily? Well, um, if we're being pedantic, uh, astrobiology technically doesn't exist because we don't have life on other planets. So uh, in that respect, I would very much agree with Didier in that uh, from a biological perspective, we're at the beginning. But we do actually know so much of uh, kind of what the background is needed in order to detect this life in order to understand it in that in in that aspect we're very well prepared but it is is it is at the start yes okay thank you and finally you madhu and then we'll turn to the audience questions yeah so so i, I read it uh, didier's statement slightly differently and my own statement uh, is that we fundamentally have to be open about what kind of life is out there 
just from statistics, uh, just from a numbers game as we started uh, this conversation, I think it's very likely, uh, and uh, I'm being out there, it's very likely that there is some kind of life form out there just from a numbers game because we have billions and billions of, of these stars and planets around them. So, uh, but we do have to be extremely open in the kind of biologies that uh, might exist out there and we just have to look. And on a 10 year time frame, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if we detected uh, a possible biosignature in another system um, out there. So I'm very optimistic, so we'll find out. Thank you. So I'm now going to turn to the audience questions, which have been amalgamated, because of course there are many similar ones coming in. And I'm going to turn first to you, Nick, because there's one here which is um, from an alumnus arts student, uh, modern and medieval languages, he says. Uh, and he'd love to know more about what the arts and humanities scholars that you mentioned will be doing um, as part of this endeavor. And are there specific goals that they are pursuing? That's a good question. Uh, so I alluded to activities that we had in mind uh, at the very beginning, um, but one activity that uh, is going to start pretty much immediately is our regular communication and meeting scholars from arts and humanities to really discuss and dissect uh, the terminology that we as scientists typically use when we talk about um, the origins of life on Earth and its probability, uh, the probability that it might uh, exist elsewhere. When I say terminology, I mean uh, even terms like a cradle and origin are loaded with, uh, with bias uh, because we use those words and frame them in our own uh, singular example of, of uh, life and its origins today. So really that um, discussion is an opportunity to uh, sort of free us of those biases and, and really explore uh, the broader implications of what life is uh, in the context of, of what we're doing. Thank you. I, I, I agree with you. I think um, an announcement of a biosignature on another planet would be an enormous cultural moment, just as much as it would be an enormous uh, scientific moment. So this one, I think I'd like to direct to you, Emily, although you may, of course, pass it on to someone else. If a nearby exoplanet had life that was remotely similar to life that existed at any point in Earth's history, would we have a good chance of being able to detect it from its biosignature? So you can use any bit of Earth's previous history. So, so I think it will very much depend on what part of Earth's history we're looking at, because it's a lot easier to detect life as it is on the planet at the moment than it is right at the start where we've only got microbial life and we don't have oxygen in it a photosynthesis so we don't have high levels of oxygen so it'd be very very hard to detect those sorts of levels however as you go through time you have uh, increase in, in in different sorts of biosignatures so it's not so much one biosignature but the combination that would be the really exciting bit and the different combinations of biosignatures potentially corresponding to, di to different levels of kind of ecological and bio biosphere complexity okay thank you and maybe you could follow up with this what would you think would be the most exciting biosignature marker uh, that could be found, apart from water, it says, uh, in, in an atmosphere? What would be for you the most exciting? Well, to be honest, it's not, a, it's not about a single one. It's about having combinations of them. And I think when we're looking for this really extraordinary discovery science, we just need to be so much more cautious than we would be if we're dealing with, with um, things here on Earth. So I think a combination of, of high levels of oxygen with um, something like methane or carbon dioxide would be really, really exciting. Okay, thank you. Let me throw this one to, to Madhu. Um, it says, can current technologies distinguish between spectra of atmospheres, which may be multi-phase and signatures of the planet's surface if the atmosphere is transparent? Can we assume that we cannot measure flow rates of atmospheres? And if that's the case, how long do you think it would be before that could be achieved? So we, there are ways in which we could detect sur, uh, the presence of surfaces on exoplanets. And if there is, for example, uh, an ocean underneath, uh, those sorts of things we can detect, but the detection uh, is, there are various ways uh, people are proposing but one of the ways is to look at the atmospheric composition of these planets and see, look for signs of chemical disequilibrium and see what sort of disequilibrium, um, process, disequilibrium signatures, the presence or absence of an ocean uh, 
uh, could induce in the atmospheric composition. So, so yes, we, there are ways to detect uh, the presence of surfaces on these uh, on these planets, uh, and it also depends on what your atmospheric bulk composition is. Is it like a nitrogen oxygen rich atmosphere like we have on Earth? Or is it more a CO2 atmosphere like, like on Mars, CO2 rich atmosphere? Or is it more like a hydrogen rich atmosphere as would be the case in very early Earth or on slightly bigger planets which have retained much of their primordial hydrogen? So depending on what kind of planet uh, you look at, uh, all of those could be habitable in principle, uh, but we have to look at their bulk uh, in for the bulk atmospheric composition and then look for signs of disequilibria chemical disequilibrium in those atmospheres and try to infer the atmospheric process as well as surface process on these planets. Okay, and when you say disequilibria, what you mean is that life of its nature almost uh, needs chemical reactions which are not in equilibrium. Left to themselves, the atmospheres would settle down into rather exactly. boring chemical exactly. states. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, so now let me, let me throw one to you, Nick. Um, I'll start with the atmosphere and then I'll move on. But first, if you had access to the atmosphere of Mars, if you could, if all you had was access to the atmosphere of Mars, would it show any chemical markers of life that you're looking for on other exoplanets? And which markers does it exhibit? Now, I suspect this might be to do with the old life versus new life business. But anyway, I'll hand that one to you to start with. That's an excellent question. Um, so uh, much of the work on biosignatures, planetary biosignatures early on uh, suggested that oxygen could uh, be uh, an interesting and robust biosignature because we know that um, oxygenic photosynthesis produces oxygen as its principal waste product. Um, but now we know that there are many ways that planetary atmospheres relate oxygen and, um, and now it's not really regarded so much as a, as a robust biosignature. The reason why I bring this up is because um, we think about um, the evolution of our own atmosphere uh, in the context of oxygen production, uh, because cyanobacteria were the principal uh, uh, primary producing microbes at that time. And a lot of that logic is carried over to the Martian atmosphere. And, uh, and so for a long time, scientists expected atmosphere would become oxidizing uh, if, if oxygenic uh, uh, microbes were present. It actually turns out that our understanding of um, climate and geological events on Mars are, are now leading to models where the redox state of the ancient atmosphere was probably widely variable, oscillating between oxygenic and, and anoxic uh, back and forth purely because of geological phenomena. And that's a concept that as Earth scientists, um, uh, it was very difficult to wrap our minds around. So in thinking about the, the evolution of the atmosphere, I think the biggest challenge of the ancient Mars uh, is that it was probably so variable and subject to so much change uh, given uh, the stochastic geological events that characterized its early history. Um, I, I think it's difficult to draw an analogy with, um, with the current atmospheric properties. Um, so I'll, I, I, I guess I'll sort of leave it there. Okay, I've got a rider for you, another question. Um, you concentrate on Mars, but Venus long ago was presumably just as likely to have had life. So is that ignored just because of the extreme difficulty of getting anything onto the surface? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Venus uh, is similar in chemical makeup uh, to the Earth uh, and Mars, um, as, uh, as many of the audience will be aware. But I think one of the fundamental differences between Venus uh, and the Earth and Mars um, is its volatile content. So for example, uh, uh, speaking in terms of uh, planetary budgets, Venus is bone dry. It has very little H2O. And that apparently has made all the difference for its geological evolution. As a consequence, it never experienced plate tectonics. And so uh, it undergoes a very catastrophic and periodic resurfacing of its, um, of its planetary surface. But without meaningful uh, planetary concentrations of water, um, we think we're dealing with a very different, uh, different ball game that's much harder to understand uh, than it is uh, for Mars, but, but potentially no less interesting. Uh, so I think Mar uh, Venus is a very interesting target, in particular its atmosphere, because it's a very different chemistry and, and it's potentially uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more palatable to, uh, to the microbes that we know and love on Earth. Uh, but, but I think for those reasons, Mars has uh, naturally been the, uh, the preferred target. Okay, thank you. I'm going to come back to you, Emily, now, because there's a couple about evolution here. Um, and the first one is, uh, we tend to describe evolution as taking long periods of time, but there might be an increased speed of evolution in other, other environments. 
Are there any constraints that we know of regarding the speed of evolution besides the rapidity of generations of creatures? Oh, well, those are very good questions and, and ones we think about uh, all the time. So um, when we think about evolution taking long periods of time, that is absolutely how we think about it, but it, that's not necessarily the case. And it's not just bacteria that have the capacity to evolve pretty quickly. Um, uh, we see within human lifetimes, uh, uh, different, different animals evolving, especially on islands, um, which are very, very isolated. You see animals evolving very quickly, things like Darwin's finches or animals, lizards in the Caribbean. They evolve to their different niches very, very quickly and in very similar ways, which is quite interesting. So the kind of the speed of evolution and the speed in which animals speed, um, turn into different species does actually, it can be quite rapid. Um, uh, the other aspect of it is um, uh, kind of, you have different levels of speciation. So when we think about the speed of evolution, one way to think about it is how fast the species turn into other species. And what you see is different groups of animals, for example, will, will speciate at different rates and some very, very high, uh, high rates, some quite low. And you see, th you, you see lots of different sorts of patterns. So for example, um, animals that are very specialists tend to speciate quite fast, whereas more generalists, animals that can survive in lots of different environments will be a lot slower. So you have a lot of, a lot of variation in understanding what's, what's driving evolution, what's causing speciation. And so when we're thinking about life on other planets, that's something that's, that's really interesting is how, how would um, life uh, and evolve on different planets and how would things like different temperatures and different pressures and indeed potentially different atmospheres change these, these kind of fundamental rates of, of evolution. Okay, now let me give you another rider. Uh, so there's a sort of follow-up question sitting in the sheet as well. Um, there's been suggestions in the past that there could be silicon-based life forms as opposed to carbon. Um, do you have any view on whether that's a possibility or any of the panel, in fact, but let me start with you since you're on. I would slightly defer to chemists at this moment and, and how, how easy is it to make um, silicon-based life forms and how do the really crucial things like water and different solvents break down. Um, so I, I, I tend towards uh, just carbon-based life forms, to be honest, uh, because that's, that seems to be a lot, uh, a lot easier. Uh, quite frankly, than creating silicon-based life forms. And yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got a few more minutes. Um, this one I think goes to you, Madhu. Uh, to what extent do you think the James Webb Telescope will be an information game changer with respect to extraterrestrial life? And how much more quickly might we be able to make discoveries with that compared to Hubble? Yeah, so that's a very good question, very relevant uh, for the present time. Um, there are planets, we have already identified uh, several habitable planets uh, in which in whose atmospheres we could potentially detect biosignatures over JWST's nominal lifetime between five to 10 years. So within this decade, it is possible that we can detect atmospheric signatures in some of these planets. Whether, obviously, whether they will detect biosignatures or not depends on whether there is actually life on these planets or not. But if they are inhabited uh, and if they have the biosignatures at levels we expect for, uh, for, for uh, life to produce, then it could be detected within, uh, within the next 10 years, within this decade, using this transit spectroscopy uh, that I was talking about before. Now, it's incomparable with anything that we, uh, the capacity of James Webb uh, Space Telescope is incomparable to anything that we have known so far. But definitely, I mean, I work with the Hubble Space Telescope observations all the time, and it's a game entirely different a game changer, much more sensitive uh, to habitable planets. For example, right now, we wouldn't be able to do such measurements with the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's because both the sensitivity, as in how faint an object you can observe, as well as the just the wavelength range, all the way up to uh, beyond 10, 20 microns, uh, all the way from less optical, uh, you know, red optical, that sort of wavelength range has not been possible uh, with existing facilities. So it is a huge game changer in our search for life. So if these planets do host life, then it is, I, can, I see it as very possible that we might be detect, we might detect some of those within this decade. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got one here for you, Nick. Uh, this is a planetary science one. Um, how can we best assess the oceans below the surface of the moons of giant planets for life like Europa and Enceladus? NASA is very interested in further exploring those moons uh, with a combination of um, orbiting missions, uh, mainly geophysical 
um, based missions. Uh, but there are concepts uh, in the works for uh, uh, potential land admissions as well. Um, I think there's a lot of fascinating uh, uh, planetary scale geophysics that goes into um, the sort of ice covered uh, oceans that uh, we're referring to here. But um, a lot of the basic questions about the chemical composition uh, and, uh, and the environments that may be uh, associated with those, um, those moons uh, could potentially be answered with a, a single uh, successful mission that could land and, and take a few uh, up close measurements. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to stick with you for another one, which, which is something we get asked about almost every field of scientific endeavor. Um, but in this case, it says, other than a very human desire to know, is there likely to be any benefit to this research, uh, this endeavor to find life? Would research money be better directed to more applied studies of our planet and the universe? Yeah, that's a that's a very fair question, uh, and the the motivation uh, for understanding whether or not life uh, existed on our planetary neighbor and indeed any other planet uh, is very deeply rooted in in uh, in the human experience, and it's it's something we're essentially hardwired for. But I will say though that the process of of uh, conceiving and and implementing missions of this sort have resulted in countless uh, technological spin-offs. Uh, so NASA actually documents um, all of the examples of uh, patents and technological spin-offs that have resulted from, uh, from solar system exploration. Um, and they're too numerous to count. And so um, going through uh, the act of, of basic research um, results in, in countless uh, technological advances. In fact, many of the um, uh, many of the technologies and materials that we use uh, and are familiar with today are the result of, uh, of uh, basic research and not necessarily directed research. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is the final one, I think. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier on that we were that, that extrapolating from your few thousand planets, there must be billions out there. Um, are we not approaching the point where it becomes a mathematical certainty that life does exist elsewhere in the universe? Um, and I'll uh, I think I'll, in, I'll invite Maddie to, to reply to that one. It's, it's, it's very close. I agree with that. It, it, you know, that's, that's where my optimism comes from. It, it feels like it's got to be there. Life's got to be there uh, in, on other planets just by the numbers. And uh, we just have to look. Maybe we'll find them within this decade. Maybe it'll take uh, bigger telescopes uh, in the future to find them. But it almost feels like it's a certainty that we'll eventually find it. But I tend to also believe that even a non-detection with all the sensitivity that we've got, even a non-detection of life within this decade or within the next couple of decades would be a huge revolution uh, uh, in our understanding of our own uniqueness uh, in the universe. I think that is almost as important scientifically as the actual detection of life is my personal view. That's very interesting. I mean, I would comment that um, everywhere we go on earth and we look for life, we seem exactly. to find it even in the most hostile environments. So uh, if you have uh, 10 billion shots at it in one galaxy and probably uh, hundreds of billions of galaxies, then um, it seems hard to believe that life wouldn't find a niche. Um, but you, exactly. have to, you have to do the I, experiment. I agree. Right, I, I, I would. I was just going to say, I would only add that the same logic applies to uh, the exercise of looking for ancient life on Mars. You know, if we can conclusively say that uh, Mars is never inhabited by bacterial life, that gives us enormous amounts of information about um, the role of the environment in facilitating the origins and early evolution of life. And as Madhu said, our own uniqueness. Uh, it basically it tells us that even though you know early Mars is associated with water, volcanoes, you know thick atmospheres, you know friendly climates, if that wasn't good enough, why wasn't it good enough? And what does that say about our own origins? Yep. Okay, so I'm afraid we've run out of time, um, but I'd like to thank all of you on the panel, uh, and I'd also like to thank all of the audience for their very interesting questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer absolutely everything. But I think we've made a fair shot of doing a, um, a scan across the field. So thank you to Professor Nicholas Tosca, Dr. Emily Mitchell, and Professor Niku Madison um, for such a fascinating conversation. Uh, the next Cambridge conversation will take place on Thursday, the 26th of May at 5.30 p.m. And the Vice Chancellor will be hosting a discussion focusing on digital humanities. And we do hope that you can join us then. And in the meantime, this conversation will be shortly posted on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much to you all for, for joining. Mm -hmm.